also have here Ivan Sanchez, yeah. the, the big man of, uh, of mapping in Spain. Yeah, I have been working in Spain since 2006, something like that. Uh, but I will be stepping down from that role because uh, we are going to have the cadastro info. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I hope this year, the tool has been in development for two years now for importing all buildings from all municipalities in Spain. And we are hoping to just uh, make a lot of buildings with full addresses and building sheets. So that's Shipment. a pretty major government data set. Being yes, yes, it is. And uh, yeah, we're really grateful because the Castro office has just opened that data for everyone. If you just modify the data, the results of the modification are yours. So that solves all kinds of problems with licensing. It's just perfect. Licensing for That's pretty cool. So, did you were you involved in uh, negotiating that with the? With Not the really, government? but I have been uh, several years uh, attending conferences in Spain regarding uh, mapping agencies, and government data, and open data, just trying to push the idea of more openness in government. Which I think I have something to do with, with that point of view. That I can be sure. And they've decided to. Sounds like they've decided to go for it pretty wholeheartedly, really. So uh, the thing is that uh, the Castro office spends money on making the very, very detailed building maps because it's, uh, run, it makes economical sense to do so. If you, in, in Spain, you get uh, land tax, mm. depending on how big your house is or your land mm -hmm. is. So if the tax office spends money on mapping land uh, properties, they will get that money back. And the point here is, they don't care if you use the data afterwards, because it has fulfilled the purpose. They've got okay. a primary use case in mind. Yeah, the primary use case is fulfilled and they got their economic return already. So they don't care if you download it and do whatever you want. That's it. So that's why they have opened it. Interesting. I've certainly heard the same uh, arguments being put forward for uh, UK uh, postal addresses and this sort of thing. That, uh, yeah, if you already got the return, use case, then, there's uh, no, no harm in sharing the data with everyone. Yeah. That's, well, that, that's pretty impressive that the Spanish, Spanish government are going for it in that way. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been going for one year and a half, but the data format is too uh, weird. It's a bit weird, so the tool needs to take into account very specific cases and overlapping geometries and all this kind of... Mm, lots of importing yeah, challenges. Lots of these uh, importing changes that you have to need to be aware of when you're a technical person and want you, your tool to give. So did, you say you're, uh, did you say you're moving to Norway now? Yes, I have moved to Norway two months uh, ago. I got a so you're mapping in Norway now? I will map, uh, actually I will map the sea in Norway because my, uh -huh. my company works primarily with boats. So yeah, You're doing a bit of open sea map. I hope so. Uh, open sea map is quite an impressive project. It uh, has lots of features, but there are very few people mapping the seas because it takes a boat yeah. and lots of resources to map the seas. So right now, most companies in the maritime business just buy the same sea charts once and time and time and time again. Mm -hmm. So it really makes sense to develop your own non-official sea charts. And then it's a uh, it comes back to the question of authoritative data. Because by law, if you own a boat, you must have a copy of the authoritative data in your yeah. boat. Yeah, there is some uh, awkward liability issues around maritime stuff, isn't there? We don't want people That's driving it. oil tankers using open street map necessarily. Maybe we do. <laughs> Maybe we do. Maybe eventually. we do because the, that information will be more updated than the official one. Maybe we do. Maybe so we what don't. kind of things go into a open sea map? I mean, uh, is the positions of the boys on, on the shipping lane? It's primarily uh, oh. yeah, shipping uh, boat lanes and then uh, lighthouses and seaports. That's the main things in the again. Uh, and the sea charts has all have also a very important data, which uh, bit, uh, bit of data we have, which is the depth mm. of the sea on, uh, on lots of points because uh, you know that ships have a big part of them. Uh, underwater. So you have to make very, very sure that your ship is not going to crash into land underwater. So is that something that OpenStreetMap can help with? I mean, uh, yes, because uh, it's, it's everything is uh, based on soundings, actually. So you get your ship on top point, drop a sonar until it comes back, you bing, bing, and that sonar echo just gives you a distance to the underground, to the underwater ground. You repeat that lots and lots and lots of times and you just uh, smooth the data with JS tools and get a very fancy elevation model for underworld. 
school. So you're hoping to make a, an open licensed I don't know yet. elevation model? I don't know yet. But it would be fun to do so. Could be an interesting one. I mean, the, the main business of my current company is not maps. So I don't know how much we'll be able to help out on OpenSea. But you're still volunteering for OpenStreetMap? Absolutely. I'm still doing some work. I'm not as active as four years ago. And I was just with my GPS everywhere because now everything is mapped. And uh, it takes much more effort to, complete, to reach this 99.99999 completeness. The more complete OpenStreetMap is, the more effort it takes. Yeah, the harder it is. To, yeah. So nowadays I, I spend time with tools like Mabrulet. I just clean up data with the just value. Map I, is quite neat, isn't it? Yeah, if I have a spare time, I use the hot uh, task manager to help out mapping humanitarian purposes. It's mm -hmm. great. I mean, if you got two hours to kill, you get you log into the hot uh, task manager, you grab a small village somewhere in the developing world, and you map it out. That's just, that's very useful. That's a way that anyone can help fairly easily, isn't it? Tell to, to, to you where to. Absolutely, where to I was I was helping a little bit during the high TF wave. You can remember that I was just uh, cleaning up data, but that resulted uh, that ended up being very useful for people using that data to have the SRL, the search and rescue zones in OpenStreetMap, even if if it was temporary data. Mm -hmm. It was good data. Uh, Haiti was a big story for OpenStreetMap, of course, as yes, it potentially saving lives with the Yeah, with the I, I do think so. I really do think so. You see, if you don't have maps, you don't know where to go, especially when you go to another country. There's this magical thinking in humanitarian uh, action uh, that if you just send people and send resources, you're going to help the world. And it's not that simple. If you send people to another country, they're going to eat up your resources. They need transportation, they need food, they need lodging. And they, knew, they need to know where they have to work. So whenever you are sending a brigade of firefighters to do some search and rescue operations, you need to provide them with the data they need to do their jobs. And that was what OpenStreetMap did back with Haiti. Right? And again, there are lots of uh, other humanitarian problems which are not solved by means of more resources, are solved by means of better logistics. I mean, most of the hunger problems are not caused by l lack of uh, resources. The humanitarian uh, associations and foundations have the, the resources for that. The real problem is you cannot physically get a truck to a village because they're going to shoot you down. For example, uh, those yeah. kinds of problems. Uh, yeah, Doctors Without Borders just uh, went out of Sudan because they were being shot inside. But maps help with all of this because maps it, it do helps help with to that because you get a very clear idea of where you can go and where you cannot go. Mm -hmm. Actually, it, when, when you are doing humanitarian uh, aid, you need to be very, very clear about where are you going to help. And is there anyone else helping that already or not? Because maybe you just redoing some work <coughs> there, so. So the hot tasking manager is quite a nice way of uh, getting involved in yeah. improving From a, maps it's, for It's very low profile, you don't need to have any special skills. Yes, if you have edited open stream map based on aerial imagery, you can use the hot tasking manager. And you mentioned uh, map roulette as well. Which yeah, map roulette is a fun way to solve uh, problems, uh, like yeah. topological problems. There's a lot of bugs in the US that's mostly yes, pointed absolutely. out. Absolutely. It's uh, the, the you, you know the case where uh, two streets are not crossing in one point in the run, they just uh, overlapping and there is no crossing point in the middle. So you cannot, if you have two roads like this, you cannot route uh, a turn. You, they have to be intersecting, right? So that's kind of one of the kinds of problems that map roulette solves. Yeah. You just log into, you just go to the map roulette website and it will show you Find One of the 2,500, for example, points where they need help, or they need just uh, please check out this data to see uh, to check if it's right. So you just go to our right if you have time to kill, uh, fix something. <laughs> it's uh, it's fine. Maproulette.org, very cool. Yeah, it is. So how are you finding the conference so far? Oh? How are you finding the conference so far? Uh, it's, it's always it's fun, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's always fun to be here and to meet like. 50 or 100 friends from from past years. That's always wonderful. It's always good to see you, Ivan. Good to see you too. Thank you very much for talking to me. Oh, it's my pleasure.